Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar for Standard Drafters. It's the last webinar we're having this year, well, at least a webinar for, uh, as a webinar for Standard Drafters. And this last webinar is the one concluding the series we had because we had during the year six webinars for Standard Drafters that handled drafting for XML. And so this today's webinar will uh, recap a bit on the series and also refresh your mind on the internal regulations part three. So my name is Els and I will be moderating this webinar as usual. You will all be muted during this presentation, but you have the Q&A part of this webinar to enter your questions that uh, will be handled after the presentation. So whenever you have a question, please enter your question in the Q&A panel and they will be handled by the speaker later on. Should you be on Twitter, please feel free to tweet about the topic or about your experience. We have a dedicated hashtag training for standards and our handle is at standards for EU. So please let me have a moment to introduce the speakers of today. My colleagues Amy Jane Conley and Marlies de Koning will be uh, presenting you the recap of the series. Uh, please ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you, Els. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Amy Jane, um, and today we will be discussing um, just a brief introduction of the webinar. We'll then look at the drafting for XML, so we'll take you through a recap of the key points. Um, basically, everything that we have discussed this year in terms of XML, so how the XML is created. We'll take a look at the templates for both Cent and Senelec, and it's worth mentioning that everything within this webinar and indeed the rest of the series is applicable to both Cent and Senelec. Um, we'll recap on the figures, the technical requirements surrounding that. We'll look at the tables again. We'll take a look at formulae and some citations as well. And then at the very end, we'll take you through the internal regulations part three and just refresh you on those drafting rules that we have in place. So as Els has already said, this is the last webinar of the series um, and you can check out all of these webinars via the link available to you when you receive the PDF, but they are available on our website as well. So you can access them all there. There's the recordings and everything is um, all very much in more detail for you. Um, we're gonna go through a recap of, as I've said, the key points discussed this year, but we're also gonna take a look at some questions that we've received from the Q and A's from each webinar. Um, any issues that we've identified within the drafting that's been pre present in text submitted after each webinar and a few email questions that we've had as well um, just to sort of tie everything in together nicely. It's also worth mentioning this webinar series that's happened this year will be used within the technical body officer training as well so if you're going to attend the technical body officer seminar you should also take a look back at the webinars um, if you've missed any go and refresh yourself there. Um, and if we talk about any, uh, any points within this webinar and you want more detail, again, go back and take a look at the previous webinars. So now over to Marlies for the first part. Thank you, Amy, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about uh, good quality documents for XML. Um, so for XML and basically to be able to work as efficiently as possible, it is very important to have good quality documents. Um, thereby important to know is that XML is obligatory for all applicable deliverables. And it's crucial to have this good quality from the first submission because uh, it can be very time consuming to fix problems uh, which can possibly cause delays. Uh, it can also mean we have less time to spend on the actual content and you increase the risk of error. So uh, to ensure this good quality, we have requirements to fulfill. Uh, next slide, please. But before getting into these requirements, we wanted to briefly show you how we get from the Word file you submit to us to the XML file, just to give you some insight there. So. When we process your document, we use a set of tools. The most important one is Xstyles, um, which is, it's an add-in tool in Word. And you can see there a screenshot of the ribbon in Word, which has an additional tab, Xstyles. And that tab includes different automatic processes we can run in addition to our manual editing work. So for example, the tool can identify certain elements and it will add appropriate, appropriate uh, color tagging. So for example, in the screenshot here, 
you will see that orange color tagging has been added for the cross-reference to the formula. Or another example, uh, the tool can run the standards mentioned in the text against our database. And for example, tell us when a standard is withdrawn. Um, next slide, please. So once finished with the document, we export the Word document to an XML file. So using the export button, you can see there, uh, which we find on the Excels tab also. Um, and when we export, uh, we may get like an error report, um, for example, if styling is incorrect, and then we will need to fix this. Uh, so here you can see in the top left corner is a piece of text. And then when we export that, that piece of text will look like the piece of code on the right in the XML file. So basically, XML is code. So that was just to give you a little bit of insight in how we create the XML. Now, uh, back to the requirements to fulfill in order to produce good quality documents. Uh, next slide. So first thing, um, it is necessary that you use the SAN and SANLEC simple templates which you can find on the SAN and SANLEC boss sites. You will find the uh, links in the slide there. Um, and not only is it required to use the templates, they will also help you because they contain the different elements uh, in the text, both the ones that are mandatory, but also the optional ones. And every element in there is pre-styled. So you can just type or paste what you need in the template. And actually, uh, both templates are the same, except for the font. For Sen, we use Cambria. For Senelec, we use Arial. And the forwards are also different, which we will see uh, later on. So next, we will discuss the styling a little bit for the different clauses and components, uh, emphasizing some key points. Uh, first, we see here um, the introduction and clause one. The styling for these is pretty basic. The uh, introduction title is styled as intro title. The rest is body text. And for uh, clause one, the title is styled as heading one. And also the rest is body text. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, next, we have clauses two and three. For class two, uh, the title is styled as heading one, the introductory wording styled as body text, and then every reference, also the non-EN, ISO, IEC standards uh, have to be styled as ref norm. Um, if these are not styled as ref norm, this can cause problems with the tool which I will actually explain in the next slide in a minute. Um, first class three, no, go back, okay. <laughs> uh, first class three, so the uh, title is also heading one, introductory wording is body text, and also, of course, whenever you have a list, which you can see there, you will use the different list styles. This also goes for the introduction, scope one, etc. And then we have the term number, the term, and the definition. And when we have a note in class three, uh, as you may know, it is not simply note, but note to entry. Um, so although this is different, what you write, the styling is actually the same. So notes to entry and notes have the same styling. And then whenever you have a source, you will also style it as definition. Um, next, we have two examples of incorrect styling. Um, and as mentioned, if the styling is incorrect, we will get errors, uh, we'll have to fix it. And this can be very time consuming. So it's very important that you style everything correctly. So the example on the left, what you see there is uh, incorrect styling where the references have been put in a table. 
And what happens um, is that when we run the tool to validate the standard, it doesn't work simply because the tool is not able to identify these references as being references because they're not styled as ref norm. Um, so you would see there the correct example. You just, you add the standard, a comma, and then the title. Then the example on the right. Um, so here you will see that heading two has been used in term, instead of uh, term num and term. And this is a good of, example of where it can become time consuming to correct it. Because when we correct this, so when removing the heading two style, the numbering will disappear and we will have to renumber everything manually. Um, so you can also see the correct styling there. And then just uh, again, a reminder, class three has notes to entry, note one to entry, note two to entry, and not notes. So although they are styled the same way. Um, then something that maybe has less to do with styling, but nonetheless important to mention, are the is the footnote for standalone amendments. So what we see here in the incorrect example is um, the reference with the plus a1 plus a2, but of course this is incorrect. It's it's not a consolidated amendment. And this is not a valid reference number. So this means that it cannot be found in the database in this form and our tool won't be able to tag it correctly or validate it. So the correct way when we're talking about standalone amendments is to add a footnote. So you can see there, you write the mother standard as usual with the title, but you add a footnote and then in the footnote, you mention the amendments. Um, and then talking about footnotes, um, might also be interesting to mention the publication footnote. So if you have a standard that is not yet published, um, you can add or you should add a publication footnote. So here you see, um, instead of the date, you'll add an M dash. And then in the footnote itself, you'll men mention the current stage. And that's it for these footnotes. It's back to Amy, I think. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Marlies. Um, yeah, so now on to figures. Um, so with figures, you need to provide us with separate electronic files. So this is obligatory for SEN. Strongly recommended for Senelec, even though it's not an obligation, but it's worth noting that if you don't provide us with the figure files, we generally can't create any XML. Um, so we strongly recommend that you give us the figure files if you are a Senelec TC and you can get hold of them. Um, for Sen only, if figures are present in the text, but you don't provide us uh, with the separate figure files, your text will be rejected and then you'll have to provide everything again. And this can cause delays, will cause delays actually. Um, so you need to make sure that you send us absolutely everything. And that's figures, um, even if they are symbols within the text, figures for keys. If there's a figure there, we need a figure file for it. Um, just a little note on the naming. Um, there are different ways to name the figures, but we generally ask you to stick to two different types where possible. This just makes it easier for the editor. So for body text figures, figures in the general body of the text, um, choose figures uh, 001 or figure underscore one, for example. Any figures in the annexes, we ask that you do the annex uh, denotation. So A001 for the first figure in annex A or fig underscore A1. Any figures that are contained in tables, um, you can just write TBL underscore and then whichever table number it is. So in this example, it's table one. And then whichever figure it is within that table. So the example there shows the first figure of table one. Same thing for key figures. Um, tell us the, the figure number. So in this case, it's figure one. And then whichever number of the key it is. In this case, it's one. That should be nice and simple for you. Um, so some of the common styling that you'll see with figures um, is figure image. And then if you have a key, you'll use key title and key text. 
And then you'll have figure title as well. It's worth mentioning that for the key title and the key text, you won't be able to see the key text styling as you can see in the margin in the example there. Um, you'll be able to see key title, but you won't be able to see key text. We do explain how you can look at the styling behind the key text in the dedicated figure webinar. So it's worth going back to that and just to take a little look. Uh, the technical requirements for figures, um, these largely remain the same. So it's .tiff, Photoshop or .eps Illustrator format, um, 600 DPI, compression LZW, single layer, which means no auto shapes or anything like that to edit the figures, no text boxes, um, make sure it's just one single layer. And then we ask that this size 100. So this is something that a problem that we meet very regularly within texts where um, somebody's inserted the figure and then they've resized it, but they haven't resized in the word in the figure file itself. So what this means is when we uh, reinsert the figure to create the link for the XML, the figure file itself goes absolutely tiny or too big to read and we have to mess around with the figure file itself, which we can then introduce errors for it. So please don't resize it in the Word file. And if you do resize the figure file itself, um, just be aware though, if you use um, figures that are very large or very small, it can be unreadable or it can be too large for us to actually create XML. Um, we do try to keep each figure on a single page as well. So the, the figures on one page along with the key and the title together. We try not to separate them where possible. So figures need to be language neutral and you need to use keys when you do need to explain anything in there. So the example on screen is a perfect example of a perfect figure. So as you can see there, the key, ti uh, the key text style isn't showing, but the key title one is. And that's the case for all tables. Um, unfortunately, it just doesn't show you what style it is. Um, yeah, the title of a figure is recommended by IR3, but expected by X styles. So you don't technically have to have one, but we need something there for X styles. Otherwise we won't be able to create XML. So it's very much worth just explaining what each figure is. Um, and if you do have a title, they need to be simple and nice and concise with a long M dash after the figure. And you can see that in the example. So moving on to tables, um, you can find more in depth information on tables in the internal regulations part three in clause 29. Um, and a lot can go wrong with tables. So for example, we can have corrupted tables, which makes it hard or impossible for us to generate XML. And this is one of the things that takes the most time for us to fix. We can also introduce errors uh, when we correct the layout. So things can jump around if, if the formatting's gone a bit wrong, um, which can lead to the table being read wrong, which is um, the more common issue that we meet. Uh, and this creates delays in editing and then eventually the time frame if we keep meeting delays. So the way to get around this is just to keep the tables nice and simple and concise. Um, draft them up simply, keep everything in one cell, try not to merge or split cells, that kind of thing. So the most commonly used styles that you'll have, a table title, um, which you absolutely need. So again, as for figures, the table title isn't actually strictly needed but it's expected by X styles. And again, if you do use a table title, um, you need to use the long M dash after the table number. So you can see that on the example, exactly like a figure. You'll then need to use the table header for the first row only and for the rest of the table, except for any footnotes or notes to the table, it needs to be table body. If you're having trouble fitting all of the content in, you can use table body minus, which just reduces the font size a little bit, or you can use table body minus minus. I think that's as small as it goes. Um, failing that, you can use uh, landscape tables as well. As you can see in the example on screen, there is a hidden border. So that is um, not a split or merge cell, and it's actually better for the editor if you do this, because this means we are guaranteed to get XML out of it. If you start splitting and merging cells, this might be necessary for you, but we ask that you do that at the very, very end of the drafting um, as a very final step. Try not to do that as you're drafting the table up, because it does cause some problems. And then in terms of the layout, you need to make sure that the title always comes before the table. Please don't put it afterwards because we will have to fix this. Um, and if you have any dimensions, there is an example coming to show you this, um, but any dimensions, these need to go between the title and the table. And there is a special styling for that as well. So looking at styling uh, table array content, so this is for non-designated tables. So that means tables that are used for layout purposes only that don't have a number and that are not showing any specific information. 
Um, so for table arrays, you could uh, use figures for this, um, in which case you would style it as table body. And in the case of subfigure titles, you would style it table body and you would just make it bold. For any list content that you have, you would use table body. And for any formula explanations or keys, however you'd like to call them, you would just use table body as well. So superscripts and subscripts uh, for footnotes to tables. This is uh, something that's quite important and we get a lot of errors regarding this that we then have to go in and fix. And if you have a lot of footnotes in your table, it can get very, very time consuming. Um, so we ask that you choose either superscript and subscript or raised and lowered, not both. We do go into detail in this in the tables webinar. Um, but just to sort of refresh you, you can see there's two examples on your screen. So there's a blue example, which is superscript and subscript. So you'll highlight the text and choose superscript or subscript. And then you have the red example, which is to raise or lower the text. Um, so pick either of those, try not to do both because we have to put it to just one or the other. And it's worth noting as well, only use A, B or C. Um, for footnotes, don't use asterisks or anything else. Just stick to A, B, C, nice and simple. So finally, just a whistle-stop tour through some other problems that we meet. Um, try to avoid long cells where possible. Uh, this can create an unstable XML that will eventually corrupt and it will be quite difficult for us to fix. Um, it's very simple to do, just split your cells and um, hide the border, basically. I've already mentioned that you need to avoid splitting and merging cells uh, everywhere. Um, so see our guidance on hiding borders if you do want to um, merge cells but not merge them. Uh, it's worth noting that vertical text is acceptable for readability purposes. So if you want to put everything on a single page, you can turn the text vertical, but try not to use this uh, systematically throughout the whole thing. Just stick to the header rows, it tends to work better there. Um, if you want to add any cell shading or anything like that, just bear in mind that white text isn't supported by XML, so it's better to use black or dark text on a white or light cell background. Um, otherwise, the XML just won't show that text at all. Um, don't split any cells diagonally either. If you want to split cells, make sure it's horizontally or vertically. And finally, this is a big one. Please don't provide any images as tables. They have to be editable with the exception of flowcharts. Um, so we see that any tables have been provided as images. We'll ask you to redraft those. Um, that can cause a lot of delays for you. Now back to Marlies for the formulae. Yes. Um, so first of all, um, we would like to ask you uh, when you deal with formulae to please use map type um, it's a paid software, but especially when you often have documents with a lot of equations, it's worth making the investment. Um, math type is required to be able to create XML. And if we have to convert uh, the equations ourselves to math type, there's a greater possibility of errors. So to avoid errors, it's better if the formulae are in math type from the start. However, if it's not possible to use math type, you can use the equation builder in Word, which you can see there when you go to the insert tab and then choose equation. Um, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, maybe it's good to mention the third bullet point first, because where possible, you can actually just simply type the formula without using an equation tool. Um, especially, for example, for simple variables. And this will also reduce the size of the document if uh, you're, you, you will just type formula. And if there are a lot of them, this will reduce the size. And also to avoid errors, because uh, we will not have to convert them. Um, so the simple templates have a formula style that allows the use of a tab between the formula and the number. So you'll have the formula, then a tab, and then the number. And when you use the formula style, the layout will be correct. So the number will be on the right-hand side, um, as we can see in the example. So please do not, for example, put the formula uh, in a table, uh, to make sure that it looks okay. If you use the correct style, um, 
that will happen automatically. Um, then about the explanations and the keys to a formula, these should be laid out in a table and styled as table body. Now, what we wanted to mention here is if you have mat type in the first cell, like in the example here, uh, the document often gets corrupted when we process it using our tools. So to avoid this, you could add an empty column to the left, or in this case, uh, as discussed, um, you could just type um, the formulas in because these are not complex. So you could also do that. And it's already back to Amy. Thank you, Marlies. Um, so just a quick note on citations. So this is going to cover the normative references and any uh, in-text citations that you might have. So it goes without saying for normative references, actually ensure that they're normatively referenced. It seems stupid to say that, but we do get a lot of uh, references that aren't normatively referenced that are in clause two. Um, there are specific rules on dated versus undated references as well. Um, as that's quite a heavy topic, we refer you back to the webinar dedicated to that. Um, all tables, figures and annexes have to be referred to in the text, and this can be as simple as C figure, table, annex, and then the number. It doesn't really have to be too complicated. Um, and if you have any clause references, this is another area that sometimes gives us some problems. Um, so if you're referring to a general clause, then you need to just write C clause 4. You don't need to add the subclause title, you don't need to add the clause title, anything like that, just C clause 4 is sufficient. Um, if you have any subclauses, you just need to write C 4.1, for example, or C 5.1, instead of C clause 4.1. Um, both of these ways of laying things out just allow our tools to work. So it picks it up and it makes sure that that clause is actually present in the document. If you use any automatic numbering or field codes or anything like that, um, that can be very useful for the drafting. Um, and if you have a lot of uh, in-text citations, it can actually be recommended to use them. However, before you submit them to us, you need to make sure that you remove them. Um, this is because when we process the text, these field codes effectively get broken, the links get broken, and it changes it to this error text that we then have to go through and manually delete which if you have a lot of them throughout your text and it's a long text, this is incredibly time consuming. So that's something to be aware of. So if you use them, remove them before you submit to us. And then a word on bibliographic references. Um, you can number these if you want to, but it's not obligatory. Um, and if you're going to number them, you just need to do it with a square bracket with a number inside. And then throughout the text, again, it's uh, optional if you want to use um, the references. If you do, however, use the square brackets. Um, and the layout of any references to other standards in the body of the text is important. You need to do this correctly, otherwise our tools don't pick things up. So it's enough that you write EN and then a space and then the reference number with no spaces or anything like that, um, even if it's a part five, as you can see in the example on screen. If you put any spaces within that reference number, our tools don't pick it up and it tells us it's an invalid standard. Um, same thing if you're dating the reference, don't put any spaces between the colon or the date or anything like that because our tools won't recognize as a dated standard. Uh, the same thing if you have any um, technical reports, technical specifications, ENIEC, ENISO documents, anything like that, don't put any spaces between the slash. Um, again, it just makes, makes it impossible for our tools to pick up things. And another note on this, if you are referring to technical specifications or technical reports or any ISO or IEC documents that are supposed to be EN, make sure that um, the whole reference is used. So as you can see there, CLCTR, this is a Senelec technical report. You need the CLC or the Sen at the beginning, otherwise it just doesn't recognize it as a reference at all. Um, so please pay attention to that. So now onto the IR3 key points, um, back to Marlies. Hello, Manis. Are you still with us? I was talking, but I was muted. Sorry about oh. that. <laughs> uh, so what I was saying, 
that in this part uh, we will discuss some rules to follow in accordance with IR3 and we'll again do this for the different components in the document. So first component is the forward. Uh, the forward is different for SEN and for SANELEC documents. We can see the SEN forward here. On the next slide is the SANELEC forward. Um, and as mentioned earlier, so apart from the fonts, uh, this is the only difference between the SEN and SANELEC simple templates. Um, what we can also see here is the paragraph that the paragraphs that should be added when it concerns a candidate harmonized uh, standard. Um, and what I wanted to point out is when the document is linked to a mandate, but it is not a candidate harmonized standard, you will just add um, this document has been prepared under a mandate given to Senelec or SEN by the uh, European Commission and the European Free Trade Association, full stop. You will not add the other information. Um, and then on the next slide, um, I would like to stress here, please do not forget um, when the document supersedes a previous version to add the superseding note and the list of modifications or changes uh, compared to that previous version. And also, please do not forget to add the information about the relationship of the document to other documents or parts in the series, of course, if applicable. And last but not least to remember is that no requirements, no permissions, and no recommendations are allowed in the foreword. The next component is the clause one or the scope. Uh, this is a mandatory element. Um, and what the scope does is it defines the subject of the document and the aspects that it covers. Um, it shall be worded as a series of statements of fact. This means no requirements, no recommendations, no permissions are allowed. And uh, you can see there um, an excerpt from IR3, which gives you the forms of expression, expression which you can use to write the scope. Um, back to Amy. Okay, so close to normative references. Um, this is a mandatory element, even if it's empty. And to reflect this, you have two different introductory wordings. Um, one that you need to use even if you just have one normative reference, even though it is plural, that is a comment that we sometimes get. Um, and then if you have no normative references, you just write the second uh, introductory wording. And the reason why we ask you to put it in even if it's empty is because if you, um, during the drafting procedure, realise you want to add some or we identify that some are normative, it means we don't have to then renumber every single clause because clause one, two and three are already present in the text. Um, you can't subdivide clause two, however, it can be organised how you'd like. So if you want to begin with the um, purely European homegrown references, you can do and then go into the um, parallel references and then any non ENIs or RAC texts. Um, that's entirely up to you. We do have certain verbal forms for normative referencing, which Marlise will discuss uh, later on. And if you want some more in-depth information for this, you can see the Internal Regulations Part 3, Clause 15, and that'll lay out all the rules for you. The terms and definitions, again, is a mandatory element, even if empty, for the reasons that I gave earlier. Um, you have different introductory wordings for this. So if you are um, just stating terms and definitions in this document, then you don't need to mention any external document reference. If you're referring to another document's terms and definitions, you have the option to do that. And again, you've got wording um, if you have none at all. So you have options. And it's worth noting as well that the databases given there are purely optional. You don't have to have those in. Um, this clause can be split into different sections if necessary. And we ask if you do split it into different sections that you uh, use the headings um, heading two to do that, but follow the styling that was given by Marlies earlier. And if you take any terms from external sources, you can cite this in a source as shown on the screen. It's very simple to do. Um, and you'll start that definition as we've already mentioned. Definitions shall be drafted to directly replace the term in the text. So that's the most important point. Um, it can't begin with any article. So it can't begin with a or a, 
and the anything like that, the editor will remove systematically and it can't contain any requirements. However, on a different note, any notes to the terms that you have, so any notes to entry, can contain requirements, recommendations and permissions. They don't follow the same rules as notes in the text. Um, but with notes to terms, they always need to be numbered, even if you only have one. And they restart numbering in each term. So as the terms go along, if there's just one, you'll call it note one. And now we're back to Marlies. About, yes. Um, so the next uh, component are the notes. Uh, the rules are explained in detail in IR3 in class 24. Um, when you're writing your text and you want to add the note, it's important to remember that notes provide additional information to the text. They help to understand the text, uh, but the text, the document, shall be usable without the notes. This also means that they shall not contain any information that is indispensable for the use of the document, and also no requirements, no recommendations, no permissions. So basically they should be uh, written as a statement of fact. And we can see an example there of a correct note. Um, then Amy already talked a little bit about this. Um, there are different rules for notes to entry and footnotes to figures and tables. So uh, notes to entry provide additional information that supplements the terminological data. And these may contain requirements, recommendations, and permissions. Um, and then the footnotes to figures and tables may also contain requirements. So when you need to add a requirement related to uh, a figure or table, you can do that in a footnote to that figure or table. Um, and then it's on to verbal forms. Um, you can find detailed information again uh, in IR3, this time in class seven. You will also find some examples there. Um, and the use of verbal forms is important. It's important to follow the rules uh, for the use of verbal forms so that the user of the document is able to make a clear distinction between requirements, recommendations, permissions, and possibilities and capabilities. Um, so first are requirements. The preferred verbal form for requirements is shall or shall not. Uh, in IR3, you will find alternatives. Um, however, for the sake of clarity, it's always good to be consistent, uh, if possible, of course. You can use alternatives for linguistic uh, reasons, for example. And we see there uh, an example, shall conform to. Um, then a requirement can also be expressed in the form of an imperative. Uh, this is often used in procedures or test methods. Uh, for example, there, switch on the recorder. And then very important, do not use must to express requirements of the document. Must is used for exter external constraint. Um, so you can see two examples there. For example, it's about conditions that exist in a country or a law of nature. And then we have recommendations. The preferred verbal form is should or should not. Again, alternatives can be found in IR3. Um, for example, should take into account. Um, and then permissions, preferred verbal form is may or may not. So for example, may be used. Very important here is do not use possible or impossible or can or cannot in this context, because that can or cannot is actually used for possibilities and capabilities, which is on the next slide. Uh, so the preferred verbal form is can, cannot, and there it is, do not use may in this context. So please make a very good distinction between these. And then it's back to Amy. 
Okay, so the last couple of points now that we have. Um, hanging paragraphs is one of the, the issues that we regularly meet. Um, so a hanging paragraph will be removed by the editors systematically, um, with a few exceptions. Um, but what is a hanging paragraph? It is basically a paragraph found between a heading one and a heading two, and it's impossible to refer to. So you can see on the screen, um, there are two examples. The example on the left is a prime example of a hanging paragraph. You can't really refer to the text um, between designation and clause 5.1. So the editor will usually change it to a general clause, as you can see on the right. It's usually a very quick fix, um, but where we can't just change it to a general clause, we'll often ask you for a, an alternative title. The exception to this rule is any apparatus, any reagents or clause three, that kind of thing. A note on directives and legislation, this is a very heavy topic, um, so I will be going very quickly over this, uh, but normative references to legislation and directives are absolutely not allowed. And this is because standards are not legally binding, but uh, directives and legislation are. So instead a quick workaround for this is to copy and paste any applicable requirements into the standard itself and give the directive as a source. However, we are aware that can sort of create quite a lot of page content. Um, so we ask that you use statements of facts instead when referring to directives and legislation. Avoid it where possible is what we're trying to say. Um, normative references to directives and legislation will cause delays in publication until they're resolved. Uh, we can't publish um, anything that normatively refers to a directive or legislation. So if you have any doubt about that, contact CCMC directly and an editor will be able to help you along with a technical PM. And then finally, uh, we have a note on conformity assessment. So on a very basic level, um, normative references can't be made to any of those standards that you can see on screen. So it's the EN ISO IEC 17000 series. Um, this section is very large, very detailed. So get in touch with us for further information on this. If you're not sure, um, you should speak to your technical PM contact point for this. Um, but as a very basic generic thing, please don't make any normative references to the standards that you can see on the screen.